Hello, and welcome to the Go Live Health Foundation Health Equity Webinar Series. Thank you to all of the sponsors of the series. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Transcarent. We would like to remind you that the Q&A feature is available, so feel free to send in your questions throughout the discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator who joins us from Transcarent, Shnezana Mayan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Linda, for joining us in this wonderful conversation that we're going to have in a very important one about building a people's first workplace and the new role of the CHRO. And I can't think of a better person uh, to have this conversation with than you today. Just a quick intro um, for the team. And as we're thinking about the conversation today as background, uh, Americans are living through a time of extreme rapid change, uncertainty that's ultimately altering the features of our culture in the workplace, whether it's the global pandemic or the political protests and unrest that we've seen across the country. And so as we think about the nationwide hiring freezes and as people have moved from homes to offices, offices back to homes, um, it's a completely different environment um, that CHROs are having to deal with and grapple with as they think about the future and especially next year's uh, benefit designs and programs and offerings. And so would love to introduce uh, Linda and let her kind of tell a little bit about herself uh, to the audience before we jump into our uh, Q&A conversation today. So Linda, sure. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today and certainly is an important conversation. And I think the role of the CHRO definitely has shifted. Um, my experience, I've been at Hackensack Meridian Health for the past year and a half as the chief experience and people officer. So I have, in addition to HR, patient experience and team member experience because they are so closely linked together. Prior to that, I spent 30 plus years at the Cleveland Clinic in operational roles um, in the last five years as the CHRO there. So taking care of people who take care of people is my passion. And I, I know that it directly impacts our patients and their families. So I really am passionate about creating the right system for those team members. Thank you so much, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. So let's get started about a few questions that I'm just dying to ask you as you're thinking about um, benefits and employees. So Linda, you represent one of the largest employers in the state of New Jersey. How do you think about work-life balance for your employees in this new era of remote work, the prominent focus of mental health and, and how you and your organization are really thinking about employees in, in your geography and just in general? Yeah, we've been, we've been talking about what we're calling workforce transformation. So really trying to figure out ways to provide flexible opportunities for our team members, even for team members at the bedside, flexible work schedules, being able to create their own schedules in their own times, as well as for our corporate level or support service team members, hybrid work schedules that both serve the needs of the company, but also provide the work-life balance for the team members. As we saw in the pandemic, we were able to produce at even a higher level than we were prior to the pandemic in the, the satisfaction with not having to commute to the office or to the work site was tremendous. We're right now working on making our managers more comfortable with working in a hybrid environment and how to really create culture and collaboration when you're not in the office every day or at the bedside every day. Um, nursing has always been at the forefront of flexible work schedules. And so we've been patterning some of our work after what they do with their 312s or 410s or weekend shifts and um, really trying to be as flexible as possible with every one of our team members' jobs. So in addition, you know, we do have very generous time off schedules. During the pandemic, it was hard for people to take time off though because we were sh so short staffed and we reallocated team members to different roles, particularly our support services. It was all hands on deck. They may have been 
registering people for uh, vaccines or registering people to come in and um, see their family members. But so they weren't doing their regular jobs. They were pitching in and they didn't get to take time off. So we've been working over the past couple months to try to get people to use their PTO, take some time off, particularly this past summer. It was a beautiful summer here in New Jersey. So we really tried to get people to take time off and uh, recharge. That's really great to hear. And, and are, are you starting to see a shift of people really trying? Because I think that's the biggest challenge is you give people PTO, you give them flexible time, but then it's their ability to actually able to use the time. And, yeah. uh, and how do you get other team members to be advocates to say, hey, I did it. You should, you should or can do it as well. And so I hear that as a constant pain point for most employers. Um, and how do you get employees to feel it's okay to get away from work and really being away from work, not just taking time off, but then still checking emails and attending, you know, three conference calls in a day. So yeah, we, we definitely see quite a bit of that. Yeah. Um, as you think about how employees needs have changed, um, not just once, but I feel several times over the last couple of years, as we enter what everyone is now calling this post pandemic world, um, which solutions do you find are actually working right now and which ones are not? You probably over the last couple of years have brought in and changed up a variety of different um, solutions to bolster your benefit, to attract talent, to retain talent. Um, what have you seen? Uh, people love, people don't love. Um, what is working? What isn't? would love to hear your perspective. Uh, I, tuition reimbursement and the way that we manage how we help people grow and thrive um, as a team member has changed. So we've added on a full continuum. We added certificate programs. We have a relationship with Google where we're doing Google certifications. We're trying to upskill at all levels. So not just supporting people obtaining a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, but really helping them grow where they're at and supporting that through our tuition reimbursement. Also transitioning some of our jobs. So when we looked at the job requirements, some had required one to two years of experience in a specific discipline. I'll take the call center, for example. And we trained them anyways. And so we were eliminating a whole pool of potential candidates. And so we took some of those requirements off and went more with skill-based uh, requirements for some of the jobs. And then some on-the-job training and apprenticeships. So a completely different way to look at some of the entry-level positions. And then once there are team members, how do we help them grow along a career path? So I would say tuition reimbursement, how we help them with their financials, with the um, public service loan forgiveness. We've had over 800 of our team members take advantage of that, that we've helped them through the process. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're working with local authorities on some grants for uh, career development. So really trying to help people see the possible of the future in healthcare now that we're past kind of the crisis and no one wanting to be in the hospitals. Yeah, no, th those are really great points. Have you seen any other particular needs or changes that your employees have brought up to you around mental health support or around the pharmacy benefit or around other, other services that they feel they need more of or less of? Like what, what's been the feedback from the employee yeah, we, base? We have um, a relationship with a um, employee assistance plan so we do provide very comprehensive employee assistance. And we did increase that during the pandemic and we've maintained it. So we have a 24 seven crisis hotline that acts as a navigation for team members. Um, we've had several um, call that we've, we believe prevented serious harm to themselves or their family members that they were in, in a bad way. And we were able to help them. We were able to send someone directly to them. Um, and we have also reduced or eliminated any co-pays on any of our behavioral health visits. And we've added virtual technology mm -hmm. so that our team members can access virtual visits and there's no charge to them for that. 
So we really have tried to make it as easy as possible for them to receive the care they need when they need it uh, and not be worried about what it's going to cost. We also have enhanced what we call our circle of compassion. So it's a fund that we have where people can donate money. So like when I put my donation to HMH, I send it to the circle of compassion. And if a team member is in need, financial need um, due to something that went on in their life, they can uh, apply to the circle of compassion fund and get money to help them. So yeah. that no, is- I bet, I bet. And especially the elimination of copays, because we hear so often the the barriers to access to care is cost. And so you eliminating that cost uh, clearly has helped. Have you seen a particular increase in the utilization or engagement rate of either the virtual services or the EAP services as a result of that copay elimination? And how is your company tracking and evaluating that and potentially using it on other services uh, go forward? Yeah, I definitely, I, I would say increased compliance for some of our chronic diseases when okay. we eliminated the copays for both mm-hmm. their medications as well as their physician visits. Um, so diabetes, hypertension, those, those type of chronic conditions. And then we have seen an increase in the utilization of our EAP services in our virtual visits, as well as we've expanded our urgent care networks that um, services are available to our team members. We are looking at potential on-site employee walk-in clinics mm-hmm. at some of our larger sites as well. That's fantastic. And I know we're hearing from many other employers that they're playing with that idea as well of how do you expand those on-site near site clinics? What's the uptake um, going to be? And it's all about that access. Yeah. Like how, yeah, how do you make it as easy? Yeah. The other thing we're, we're looking at adding for next year is a wellness day. So a personal day on top of their vacation and PTO that they could use. You know, our hope is that they use it for some type of, of wellness prevention visit, whether it's a colonoscopy or a mammography or, right. you know, and, and or make it on their birthday so that yeah. every year on their birthday, they remember to go have a mammography or whatever it yeah. is they need to have yeah. 70% of our workforce is female. Mm-hmm. So um, really I love that. encouraging them. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love that. And, and I think we've started seeing uh, companies, right? Definitely say, here's a mental health day. Here's a mental health week, right? How do we think about that wellness? And you mentioned earlier about the flexible PTO. It's like, if they don't take it, but that then if you set it for the whole company to say, either we're going to do it together or you get to choose that day. And I love the idea about the birthday and uh, and being able to mark that everyone should have their birthday off, but then, right. you know, focus on yourself. Uh, that is that is such a neat way of getting people to engage. How have you thought about, Linda, um, your rollout strategies and the different care experiences to your employees considering the remote work? And I know your situation is a little bit unique compared to other employers who have had a lot of employees remote, but talk a little bit about your workforce, the mix between remote versus in, in setting, in, in person setting, and then how are you bringing solutions um, to them depending on what setting they're working in? Yeah, it, um, I think we were forced quickly mm-hmm. to be agile in the solutions that we created when we sent our corporate team members home to um, eliminate any potential spread of COVID before the vaccinations and people were allowed to come back. So I think we learned quickly what was missing and how to connect. So first of all, making sure the technology works Mm -hmm. and people understand how to use it. So some training on how to exactly use the technology, some etiquette around scheduling meetings, how to be, how to what it should look like in the meeting, what your background should look like. So we've been asking all of our employees to use a background similar to what you see behind me so that it's, um, I would say, democratic of whether they're in their home or they're at the workplace and it it doesn't draw a distinction between them Mm -hmm. and people feel more comfortable because we're going to live in this hybrid world from now on. And we've heard from our team members that 
they really enjoy this. And, mm -hmm. and we've had people turn down jobs who could not have some type of hybrid option. And plus mm -hmm. some jobs can be done fully remote. So identifying and going through each of the jobs and mm -hmm. working with the leaders, this has been some of the work we've done for this transforming a hybrid work model. What, what could be done 100% remote? And if we do say it can be done 100% remote, are we open to someone working in a different time zone? What states do we want to focus on? It expands your talent pool. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then, then you have to figure out how to create collaboration spaces and culture and have them feel a sense of belonging and being part of the team. And so some of the work we've done with virtual onboarding has helped with that. But, you know, we're, we actually are going to go back to a hybrid onboarding model where we're going to do a virtual component, but we're going to add an in-person component that's going to be about fun and inspiration. Yeah. So we're going to do it at Top Golf, and it's called you know, Teeing Off. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That and is we've, we've been on this whole whole sports theme with our leaders as coaches. And mm -hmm. so it certainly has some um, cachet to it. Like the yeah. team members love it. And I bet. Yeah. I so bet. We haven't, we haven't started the, the top golf yet, but that that's coming next quarter. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's great. And, and I think something else, and would love your thoughts too, on, on the hybrid work, what I hear from a lot of other employers is they're struggling with picking, okay, which day, are we all going to be in the office? Is it a Wednesday? Is it a yeah. Monday? Yeah. Um, which meetings are important and not important? Going back to that prioritization of, okay, yeah. I'm in meetings, you know, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Is that necessary? And then when we do get together, have you experienced any challenges or success stories? So picking a day and sticking to it and it works for everyone, or has that also been a challenge of making it work? We've done, we're, we're working through collaboration space as mm -hmm. well. So, you know, this, we, we are relatively new as young as a system. Mm -hmm. And one of the things right before the pandemic hit was creating a central location mm -hmm. for all of the support services. And I think it opened maybe a month before everyone was sent home. So it, it's a completely new environment for many people. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't created with the idea that it was going to be a hybrid workspace. It's a lot of cubicles. Um, while it's open space, it's not collaborative space. So we've really been rethinking, if, we, if we're going to say all the team's going to come in on Mondays, do we have space for everybody? And how do we identify ways to work together on that Monday versus all sitting in a cube doing Zoom meetings? Mm -hmm. So we've been, that's some of the work we're doing right now on reconfiguring and modeling that with certain areas. So HR and IT are going to be two of the areas that we focus on. How do we create collaboration days and, and model the space around that? Right. That is so important. And, and, and it's that that new way of collaboration. Like you mentioned earlier, I think we've all sort of even fallen out of touch on how to collaborate yeah. in person because it is it is so different. And as people call it, the Zoom fatigue, uh, how do you sort of get yourself um, out of that is, is going to be critical. Yeah. Um, I have some other questions sort of switching gears from the workforce and the location, um, when you think about the broader landscape, right, that we have lived in over the last few years, we have the payers, the PBMs, the employers, um, they seem to be on different pages um, in terms of what your needs are versus what the needs of the macro markets are. Where does the industry go from here in terms of addressing some of the misalignment um, that many employers feel uh, today? So would love your point of view on how have you seen the market evolve? Where do you see the biggest points of misalignment are? And how would you change them? Or what recommendations um, would you have for entities to work better with, with entities like yours? Yeah, there, there needs to be more transparency. I mean, it we hear this from our team members all the time. We we are a self-funded insurance mm -hmm. for our team members. However, we do have a third party that administers it and we rely on them to help navigate. Mm -hmm. And 
it oftentimes isn't the best solution. So it's it's too complicated for team members to navigate. Is this in in my network? Is this out of my network? Is this going to cost me money? What? How much is going to cost me? And so we've actually looked at you. You end up putting an overlay on top of it that you have to navigate for your team members. Mm -hmm. What's the best solution for them? Mm -hmm. Because it's the for the insurance side it's not at all transparent. And you know all they do is process the claims and perform prior authorizations when it's something that hits their desk. And they may deny it without necessarily communicating back to the team member what the next step is. Mm -hmm. and so then we often have to intervene. And then from the, from the PBX side, you know, we, we do, uh, contract with a national provider and we do get rebates, but there's also not pricing transparency on high cost drugs and how formulate formularies are used and how they're monitoring the use of some of these new drugs that come out. Um, and I'll use the anti-obesity drug that just came out on the market that is now put on our PBX's formulary Last year, we had zero spend in that category. This year, we're up close to 2 million. And so there's not necessarily great controls on some of the new medications that come out and what they're used for and what how you're monitoring if they're doing what they said they were going to do versus mm -hmm. just increasing our cost. And, you know, we spend, that's one of our biggest expenses for our employees, aside from their salaries, mm -hmm. is the, the medical, the spend on the medical plan. Mm -hmm. And we have a very, um, very well covered medical plan that if they stay within our network, there's no deductibles and no co-pays. It's 100% if they're using our employee doctors and our facilities, but it's not always it's not always transparent to them who those people are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and what what have you sort of heard from your employees of what would help? Right, clearly transparency is a problem. Complexity is a problem. When you ask them, and I'm sure they give you plen plenty of feedback or grievances or yeah. complaints, this isn't working. I'm sure you're on the front lines yeah. um, answering some of those questions. Um, what are some of the things that they have shared with you? Gosh, you know, I was able to find whether it's a medication less expensive if I paid cash or if I did something else. Like what sort of solutions are the employees directly seeking from you that then you're having to find yourself yeah. because they feel it's not being delivered in the current approach? And, and we often get those calls after the fact, right? right? So they were with their primary care provider and they were referred to another physician or another facility without the information that the coverage might not cover what they were what was going to happen. And they went and got the care and then got the bills after the fact. Mm -hmm. So some type of navigation up front mm -hmm. and knowing that it's it's easy to call and get the answers that you need and the right person to direct you in the right place. So uh, we do have a benefit advocate center through our benefit consultant where we've been encouraging people before you go to the next step, mm -hmm. call our advocate center and make sure you're going to the right place or you at least have knowledge and transparency around mm -hmm. what what's gonna happen once you see that provider or go to that facility and what's covered and what's not covered. And that's why it's just so complicated for, and, it, and these are even healthcare professionals, but they're, they're used to providing care. They're not yeah. necessarily wor worried about the business side of it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, Until they find themselves in the position where, where they're having to, to get care for themselves and it right. still is difficult. Yeah. Right. right. It, and it, it, it needs to be simplified in mm -hmm. some way. Mm -hmm. And there's no incentive for the insurers and the um, prescription or, or drug companies, pharmaceutical companies to reduce their prices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's so important for all of us to recognize is how do we put the consumers first, the people yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that are, that are receiving the care. And um, it's just the rule of thumb, make it more simple be, be more of a trusted source or a guidance partner um, to share information up front and, uh, and then ultimately make it easy to actually get access to that care. 
right. is going to be super important um, as we move forward. And I think as the consumers get more empowered over the next um, few months and years, especially coming out of COVID, and I always use the analogy of patients are becoming more impatient uh, coming out of COVID. And, and I think being able to um, give them the information at their fingertips is going to be critical to make the best decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, as we stick on this topic of um, consumer sort of directed kind of care, giving them the information at their fingertips, um, when I say digital health, what comes to mind for you um, and what comes to mind to your employees when you think about digital health and, and where and how they want to receive it and how you're thinking about your benefit designs, not just in 2023, but through 2025, leveraging digital health as a mode to engage your employees? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think about it almost in three buckets. For sure, you know, we have Epic as our electronic medical record and Epic has a MyChart component to it, which when implemented and fully utilized can be a great tool for interaction between the care team and the team member. And that I think is essential. Um, second, the TPA that we look to to help with navigation has apps that usually, if done right, can help navigate to the right location and the right provider. That oftentimes is not the case. They're not up to date, they're not current. And then I think about providing care virtually. So virtual care visits, I think only can improve um, and keep lower costs and keep people from the EDs and the urgent cares if their issue can be addressed in a virtual visit. You can now schedule virtual visits through my chart on Epic, but they all, we also have a partner that we have a care app, a HMH Care Now app that people could use um, outside of normal hours and during the day too for a mm -hmm. virtual visit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's great. And especially as you said, as more digital therapies or digital therapeutics or solutions come about in just general consumer adoption and interest is certainly going to shape um, their, their asks or questions to you yeah. uh, to say, is this covered on my benefit? Uh, how do I, how do I get it? I'm, I'm sure that's something that's top of mind for you. Speaking of future benefits, um, and as you think about 2023 to 2025 benefit design, what are your top three sort of challenges or, or solutions, right? That the use solution for to ensure that you had the right, you know, employee presenteeism in numbers, engagement, uh, talent, retention or, or attraction, I uh, would love to kind of hear what were some key elements that were critical to your strategy as an organization? And, and or is there anything new that you're deploying as you head into next year? I think, well, obviously our medical plan is, is very important to most people. Our retirement plan, we have one of the highest utilized in retirement plans, TIAA is our provider. We're at 93% participation. So it's very important to our team members and, and we have um, a pretty much top of the market match for that. So when I think about financial and, and physical health, those are really important. But then, like I said before about the growing and thriving and making sure people have the opportunity to make a living wage. So we've done a significant investment in our pay structure. We raised all of our minimum wages. We raised our market rates. So we moved every one of our jobs up to P60 in the market instead of P50. And then we did a whole nursing scale adjustment. So we've, we've put a significant amount of dollars into making sure we're paying people a little bit above market. And then on top of that, I think the, the growth, so tuition reimbursement, loan forgiveness, scholarships, apprenticeships, and a pathway to get to the highest level job they, as, they aspire to. So helping them grow as individuals and meeting them where they're at at that point in time. And then 
um, uh, growing our leaders. So investing in our leaders as coaches so that they can help their team members grow. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so like when I think about where we're putting our money, those are the things that are important to us to, to retain who we have, but also to attract new team members. Because we want this to be a great place to work. And other people who work here have to feel like it's a great place mm -hmm. to work. And um, we're, we're at 76% um, say that this is a great place to work. We, we've made some progress. Everyone, mm -hmm. I think last year went down a little bit, right. but um, our recent pulse, we went back up. So that's yeah, was no, th those are so fantastic. And I think it's so important for all employers to think about, because it is that pay structure. And when you think about this inflationary environment that we all live in, and right. the cost to live um, in, in today's world is fundamentally different than where it even was a year ago. So that's wonderful. And kudos to you and your organization for proactively doing that versus asking for the employees to, to come seeking it um, after the fact. That's really tremendous. Um, and just, just last question, speaking of employees and you know appreciation and, and what, what we're doing, we're also have seen quite a big impact over the last couple of years around mental health and anxiety and concerns and worry um, of the employees just in general. How are you as an organization thinking about employee safety, workplace safety, um, workplace sort of security and violence and prevention? Um, what's top of mind? How are you thinking about it? And what recommendations would you have for other employers as we think about that topic in today's environment? Yeah, so I we, we have workplace violence committees at each one of our hospitals. And um, this is, is really an important topic for our team members for their safety uh, at work. And there are, there's been many studies, one just published recently by Press Ganey that um, a nurse is, is assaulted, two nurses assaulted every hour, I believe was the study. And, um, at noting high risk areas like the ED and behavioral health units, but um, we've seen an increase in that. One of the things that we've done is really worked on focusing on identifying patterns. So if you see patients, family members, other team members, or even your people in your own family, behavior changes, high anxiety, to say something, to speak up, to try to intervene early, um, ask them to go to EAP, ask them if they're okay, ask them what's going on. And if you don't get anywhere with that, to share it with someone above you, share it with your leader, share it with HR, ask for a independent um, evaluation if you're a leader. And we've done some de-escalation training for specific areas within high-risk areas in the hospital, the EDs, pediatrics, and behavioral health um, for both the front desk people as well as the team members. And then we staff those areas with security as well. But knowing that they have a button to push, a number to call, or tools at their disposal themselves, to feel comfortable saying, I'm gonna to try to de-escalate based on my training. When I get to a point where it's not, I'm, I'm not getting somewhere, I need to call for help and that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. They need to speak up when they feel uncomfortable because we never want anyone to feel uncomfortable at work or unsafe at work. Mm -hmm. We need them to be there to take care of our patients and we wanna be there to protect them and help them address any situation, to be ready for it and prepared or to exit the situation and let someone else take care of it. Yeah, no, those are such important points, yeah. Yeah, and the, the U.S. Prevention, the U.S. Task Force on Prevention just came out in the news the last couple of days, it's been in the, all the news, around screening for anxiety. And so I'm so, so glad to see that because yeah. It's not, <clears throat> excuse me, just in hospitals. It's everywhere. You see it in society, you know, mm -hmm. being in New Jersey with the subways and the trains, almost mm -hmm. every day there's something happening on the subway. And, um, you know, it's this is also where people need to speak up and intervene if they see something. 
Yeah, yeah. It's the whole thing, right? Say something if you see something. Um, in particular about that new guidance of getting anxiety screening for any adult under the age of 65, how are you preparing your workforce, like the nurses and the physicians um, in your we system? We just, we just, we've, we've, right? yeah. we've been doing depression screening. Uh-huh. Sorry. <laughs> We've been doing depression screening. Now we're talking about what do we need to add into that mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. to layer on anxiety. Yeah, yeah. And in, in, in how what what signs or symptoms do you look for? How do you get people comfortable, right? And, and addressing addressing that and having support for resiliency and stress management is so important. And giving some of those tools at the fingertips um, of the employees. So yeah, I would love um, to, to hear some tips and tricks as, as you're and, going through that yourself right now. Yeah. And our behavioral health leaders are, are going to be leading that. We mm -hmm. have um, actually the largest, I don't, I know it's for sure in the state of New Jersey, it might even be in the Northeast mm -hmm. hospital dedicated strictly to behavioral problems, okay. 260 beds. So yeah, we have, we have some expertise in that area. We're talking about putting some screening into Ep directly into Epic. Yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, this was really wonderful, Linda. I, I really enjoyed um, the conversation today. And at the moment, I would love to open it up to questions um, to our audience. As Linda just walked through and provided a ton of great feedback and perspective, whether it's the workforce, um, return to work structure, the collaboration, the incentives, the benefit design changes, um, workforce expectation um, on, on what they're looking for in terms of benefits, as well as the macro market and, and the alignment that we need from all of the administrative service providers, whether it's the plans or the PBMs or point solution providers providers to ultimately meet the needs of the consumer around simplicity and, and on-demand care, um, which I think were all great uh, points that I think all of us can take back to our own respective organizations and how we think about supporting um, our employees. But we'd love to see any questions um, from the audience that uh, Linda may be able to answer for us. Let me see if there's any in the chat. I'll give it a second. Um, if I'll see if any questions uh, come through. I guess my last question for you, Linda, any last tip or advice you would give to fellow CHROs across the country, um, what they should do or consider that they maybe haven't considered or blind spots um, that you have been able to think of yourself as, as we look ahead into the future? I think we have to become comfortable that work has transformed and we have to meet our team members, employees, where they're at with flexible work schedules and potentially thinking about if your wages are not at the living wage scale, how do we do that? How, mm -hmm. how do we, um, and there's always trade-offs in healthcare because margins are so small, um, but, but our people are our business. And mm -hmm. so taking care of people, well, the people that take care of people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Right. Is, is, is critical. Speaking of taking care of people, one question came through and said, um, how do you balance asking team members to take PTO considering the current staffing shortages that everyone is grappling with? Yeah. So, so we've been staffing to our productivity numbers with agency. So it, while it costs money, it's, we have to staff to the, the metrics that we've agreed to, what, that we feel are safe. So if we say we're going to staff at a one to four ratio, but our our we have openings, we're filling those openings with agencies so that mm -hmm. people can take PTO. That's great. Yeah, Cer certainly an avenue um, we all need to consider. It's not sustainable in the long right. run, right? We need to get back to our normal vacancy rates, right? And and it's happening slowly. I think we're in a. Uh -huh. I think of a, a slow recovery period, mm -hmm. our, our turnover is slowly going back down to where it was before and our recruitment is increasing. So at some point our lines will cross again and we'll be in better shape. Yes, certainly. And I think we all, we all absolutely hope for that. Well, I don't see any other questions, uh, Linda. Thank you again so much um, for your time today. I really enjoyed uh, the conversation and 
if the audience has any other follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to either Linda or I. And thank you again um, to the health team for having us today and having this very important conversation. And I hope everyone has a great um, rest of your day. Thank you very much. And thanks again, Linda, for your time. Thank really you. appreciate it. Take care. Thank you to Shnezana and all of our speakers. Please visit our website at hlth.com to catch up on all Health Go Live webinars. And join us in Las Vegas, November 13th through 16th for Health 2022.